Hi, welcome to our midweek Bible study. It is for the 24th of March, and we're going to be in 1 Samuel, and we're going to be in chapter 31. 1 Samuel chapter 31, and a couple of announcements. We're still meeting live Wednesdays and Saturdays. Also, um, we will have sunrise service that will be coming up on um, April the 4th and 6 a.m. And we'll be at the end of Buchanan Hollow World where we've always kind of had it. And so we invite you and welcome you to come to our sunrise service at that point. Uh, and we'll have a regular 10 a.m. service also. But that'll be what we'll do Easter Sunday. Uh, continue in your prayers for those in the church. There are some uh, physical ailments that we have right now. And, and Eric is uh, really uh, getting weaker. And so we'll just pray for him that, that when the Lord decides to take him, that it would be um, peaceful and that if God um, would, would heal him, that would be our, our, our ultimate desire in prayer is for that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Bless our study today, Lord, and ask you to be with uh, Eric and uh, his dad, Ron, his brothers and his kids and his um, family, ex-wife Tiffany, and those who are caring for him, Tiffany's mom. And just pray, Father, for you. Be with uh, others in our church, Lord, that have unspoken requests that are, are struggling. We just pray for them. And pray, Father, for our study today in Jesus' name. All right, so we're going to be in 1 Samuel 31. We are going to be ending uh, the chapter today. And so um, it's been a, a good study, this chapter. And probably the last half of the chapter or so, um, third of the chapter at least, we have been looking at uh, Saul chasing down David. Everywhere David goes, he's on the run. Uh, God has removed the spirit from uh, Saul, given it. To David. David's going to be the next king. Uh, but then in the last couple of chapters, David was kind of stuck in with the Philistines. He had gone there. Uh, Saul, the Philistines have really been building their army up. And Saul had gone to God and asked him, you know, to, to what to do. And God didn't answer him. And God was done. He's working with David now. And so he went and uh, went to a witch and try to do a seance to bring up Samuel. And that's when the voice came, uh, vision was seen. And basically the, 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 the message didn't change that Saul was not going to have God's help anymore. And then that he was going to die along with his sons uh, very soon the next day. So when this came to be, David, meanwhile, was with the Philistines, and they were getting ready to go and fight this war against David. And what was interesting about that was, was David looked like he was going to go with him, uh, but the soldiers didn't want him to. So that brings us to chapter 31. Now David has, he, they went back to Ziklag and found that all of their children and wives had been taken. The town burned down, and, and God merciful, mercifully rescued them. And then kind of reinvigorated David's spiritual walk. And so now we're going to see the end of Saul's life. And it starts in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 31. It says, The Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, Malkishua, Saul's son. Uh, now, Saul actually has four sons, uh, Ishbosheth. We're going to see him in 2 Samuel. Uh, but his three sons are killed at this time. And the battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Um, so this is the prophecy of God. Even when he went to this vision, uh, the message that he got was accurate. That him and his sons would, would be killed the next day. The Philistines army. So there's a few things we see here. Uh, one is that, that Saul's kids are affected by his decision. And the Bible says the, uh, the death and life 
are in the power of the tongue. And so we have a responsibility to teach our kids about Christ. Now they may follow him or not follow him. Uh, but if you don't tell the world and, you, and, and your family uh, about Christ and about salvation, um, then the, the, there's a verse that says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. And we want to point our kids and our neighbors and our family to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So we take that time and we say, look, at there's what the Bible teaches. Adam sinned in Genesis. That sin was passed to every single human being. Every single person who's ever born has this curse of sin on them. Nobody's perfect. There's none righteous, no, not one. None seeketh after God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that's the problem with mankind today. And the problem is sin. And, and, and we can talk about all kinds of different issues, but the issue on the planet is the issue of sin. And sin has to be dealt with. The Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. But that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because Jesus demonstrates his love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that's the salvation plan. Man sinned. God brought a sacrifice for our sin. Not a lamb, uh, not a bullock but his own son. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart he's risen from the dead, uh, you will be saved. So now that becomes our way of salvation. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Well, that is the message that saves eternally our families. Again, it may not be received well all the time, um, but it's still important to share that message. To not share that message uh, gives people no chance to respond to it. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But then it says, how are they going to hear without a preacher? And, and how uh, is he going to preach unless someone sends them? So we are instructed by God to share this word of salvation uh, to everyone. And so that's what we're doing until the Lord returns. On the other hand, if you reject God, which is, is, is obviously going to affect your eternity, and you pass that on to your family, children, those around you, uh, then you're just bringing them with you. And that's what happened with Saul. The spirit of God was taken away from him but it didn't just affect him. It affected the whole nation of Israel and affected his own children. In fact, it cost them their lives. Our decisions affect generations and generations behind us. So let me encourage you to make sure that if you're gonna reject this message of Jesus Christ, that you have done the research to make sure you know clear-mindedly that it's the right decision. And I think if you really search your soul and spirit, the inner things of man, as the Bible teaches us, um, if God is speaking to you, you'll know it. You'll know it. So then verse four, Saul says to his armor bearer, draw your sword, thrust me through with it. And uh, let me read that again. Draw your sword, thrust me through with it lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell on it. Then the armor bearer, when he sees that Saul is dead, falls on his sword and dies with him. So the armor bearer and his three sons and Saul himself, all died on that same day. And so we're going to take a second to talk about this armor bearer. Um, this is not the first time we've seen an armor bearer in the um, book of Samuel. And I want you to look at the two differences of these armor bearers. Um, 
the first one, let's go to 1 Samuel 14. And we're not going to go too deep into this because you can actually go back on YouTube and, and look at the message from 1 Samuel 14. And uh, you'll, you'll be able to, to get the details of this. But just to review the story, we're going to look at verse 6. Uh, Jonathan and uh, Saul, his father, they're kind of hiding out from the Philistines. But Jonathan has this idea that, that if God's with you, then you can do anything. And so Jonathan says to the young man who bore his army armor, 1 Samuel 14, 6, let us go to the garrison of the uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work in us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. But he says, look, there's only a couple of us, but God can do a lot with a couple of people. Let's go second and see what God will do with us. Now the armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then, I am with you according to your heart. So here's where the armor bearer in Saul's armor bearer is very similar to Jonathan's armor bearer. They're willing to go and die with that person. And we spoke about the fact that we are not Jonathan in this story, but we are the armor bearer. Jonathan is Christ. He is the one that we put on the whole armor of God. And in verse 8, Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men and we'll show them ourselves to them. If they say to us, wait till we come to you, then we'll stand still in our place and not go to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will go for the Lord has delivered them in our hands and this will be the sign. So here's his plan. We're going to call them over. You know, if they come, then we'll know we're in trouble. But if they say, wait, then that'll be a sign that God's with us and then we'll know. So Jonathan's really searching God's will on this. So both of them, verse 11, showed themselves to the garrisons of the Philistines and the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Then the men of the garrison called Jonathan his armor bearer and said, come upon us and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come on, for the Lord has delivered them. So Jonathan and the armor bearer climb up and they kill 20 of these Philistines, which is two of them. So these two armor bearers are very similar, both willing to die, both following their leader kind of blindly uh the problem is and the difference is who they're following in first samuel 11 uh, 14 this armor bearer is following the one who's following god he's following the one who's being led by god he's following the one who's waiting for the words of god he's following the one that follows the book and we're following the one that wrote the book. The Bible says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So we follow Jesus, our word, as armor bearers, putting on the whole armor of God and soldiers of Christ, trying to please the one who enlisted us. And so that's what, where we go. The armor bearer in verse 31 is following a man who the spirit has left. Now, there have been plenty of 600 that, that left Saul and went and followed the correct man of God now, which is David. And so while Saul's actions affected his own children, it also affected those who were following him. But as armor bearers, we better make sure that we're aligned and following the right one. The Bible says, if you're not for me, you are against me. And so Jonathan was protected by God in 1 Samuel 14. Saul has lost the protection of God because he violated the scriptures. And this armor bearer would have been better off carrying the armor of somebody else, David, to be uh, uh, particular. Um, and it cost him his life. He eventually died on the sword. Um, so who are you going to die with? Who are you willing to die with? In 9-11, these men who flew the plane into the buildings, they were willing to die for who they thought was God, but they know now that they were 
uh, carrying the armor of the wrong God. Uh, Paul said to live as Christ and to die is gain. Paul said, I die daily. Uh, Jesus says, however, if you believe in me, you will never die. So if we're going to carry the armor, let's carry the armor of Christ, put on the whole armor of God, and be the armor bearer that is going to have victory like 1 Corinthians, 1 Samuel 14, and not follow a path that leads to death. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not in your own understandings. And God said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. Let's make sure that when we're risking our lives, we're risking our lives for the one who gave his life for us. It's very important. Um, in verse six, the three sons died. And, and then um, the Philistines do something terrible. Uh, they come from the valley of the side. And those who were on the other side of the Jordan, saw the men of Israel and fled. And Saul and his sons were dead. They forsook the cities and fled. The Philistines came and dwelt in them. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to the strip, the slain, they found Saul and the three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off the head and stripped the armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among the people. So they cut off the head of Saul. And this was probably, we don't know for sure, but it, it appears to be a little payback for Goliath. Remember David cut off the head of Goliath. And so the Philistines returned the favor and they cut off the head of Saul. Verse 10, they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreth and they fastened his body to the wall of the Beth Shan. So they've just made a show of it. Um, our enemy is ruthless. Uh, he's a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, Jesus told Peter that, that Satan wants to sift him as wheat. Um, and it's, it's the sad part is, is that people are not following God and they're following an enemy who wants to destroy them and and they feel like like it's it's a person that is is good uh first timothy 2 26 talks about the loss coming to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will so there's an idea of of kind of losing your senses we talked about this on sunday and and losing your way and following the wrong path and the wrong person, following the enemy, thinking that somehow he has your best interest at hand, and he doesn't. He is laughing every step of the way as he draws you away from the truth and into destruction. Um, these Philistines are ruthless, and our enemy is ruthless. If Satan could, boy, he would sift us as a weed, and that's what he... But we have God, like in the book of Job, protecting us, putting a hedge around us. But if, if Satan could, he'd chop up our heads and, and put us on display. That's what he wants to do. In fact, it's what he does in Revelation to those who don't take his mark and they get the guillotine. We see that in many of the uh, radical Islam, that, that the beheading is a, is a, is a very uh, noteworthy way of killing the enemy. And so... Uh, the enemy is ruthless, and and Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will. And so follow God. Be the armor bearer of the correct one who has the spirit of God. Um, so then it comes to verse 11, and it talks about some valiant men who come from Jabez Gilead, and they heard what the Philistines had done to Saul. And the valiant men rose and traveled all night, took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and the wall of Beth Jan, and they came to Jabez and burned them there. Then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. So we're going to really look at this for a second. Who were these people? Who were these valiant men from Jabesh Gilead? Uh, they weren't with the Philistines, they weren't with the Israelites, and yet God gave them 
victory and the ability to go in there and and take care of the enemy and rescue and redeem this body of Christ. So who were they? Where did they come from? To that, we need to go to 1 uh, Samuel chapter 11. We're going to see some very interesting things as we look in 1 Samuel chapter 11. So 1 Samuel 11, there was a uh, town of Jabez Gilead. These are the people who have now come and rescued, uh, retrieved the body of, of Saul, gave it a proper burial, hid it so they couldn't do anything more to it. So in chapter 11, Saul is not yet accepted as king. Uh, there are some that, that don't think he's qualified and they don't really want him. So in Jabez Gilead, the Ammonites come against them. And the J people of Jabez Gilead kind of uh, cower to them. And, and they say in verse 2, uh, you know, what do you, or what do you want us to do? Make a covenant with us in verse 1. In verse 2, the Ammonites said, fine. I will make a covenant, put out your right eyes, and then, then we won't kill you. Well, they are obviously appalled by that, and they say, well, give us a couple days, and seven days actually, and let's figure out what to do, and, and then we'll either fight you, or we will put our right eyes. So they go to Saul, and Saul hears about it, and then look at verse six. The Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. So then what Saul does is he goes and takes a yoke of oxen and cuts it in pieces, sends it to all the people, and says, look it, this is going to be you if you don't come fight with us. We need to go protect these people. And so verse 10, he says, therefore, men of Jabesh, tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do with us whatever seems good to you. So that's the plan. God goes to them, and Paul says to them, just go tell them we're going to meet them tomorrow and give you our decision whether we're going to put our eyes out or fight you. So it came the next day, verse 11, very important. Saul put the people in three companies. They came to the midnight watch and the morning watch, killed Ammonites until the day, and it happened that those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Then the people said of, to Samuel, who is he who said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. So they are so impressed with Saul. They say, look, at this is the guy we want. Whoever says that he's not to be king, we want to know. We're going to put him to death. And look what Saul says in verse 14. Then Samuel said to the people, uh, verse 13, Saul said, not a man shall be put to death this day, for the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. So this is a great victory, the first great victory of Saul. And the men's response was, let's make Saul our king. Look at verse 15. So all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king. So this is when things were great for Saul. This is before David comes along, before Goliath. And what a victory. And here's the sad part of the, this, this end of this book. Saul is dead. The spirit of God has been taken away from him. And Jabez Gilead, the people that are significant in his first great victory, come to his rescue. And it just reminds us of what could have been for Saul. What could have been. That he could have rode that, that victory and led the people of Israel. But his pride, his arrogance, his disobedience all got in the way. And when it comes to an end, the people who he should have, have, have allowed to, to kind of guide him. And, you know, the Bible says that we should return to our first love. And sometimes in our Christian walk, we are so faithful at the beginning. We're so humble at the beginning. And then... We start studying and we get knowledgeable and with much knowledge comes arrogance. And then we decide to change the scripture a little bit. And then people start patting us on the back and telling us how great we are. Then all of a sudden we go off the rails completely and create a whole denomination, a whole church. And we're going to have church in this house because we're going to do it differently because I see God the way no one else. And we get just like Saul. And 
at the end, God brings Saul all the way back to the beginning, to when he was filled with the spirit of God and would not allow those people to be killed. So the, the real message of this chapter as armor bearers is to make sure that we're following Christ. Because if you're not for him, you're against him. The, the ways of Saul led to death. The armor bearer who followed Jonathan had great victory. Saul had great victory with Christ and with God. Failure without him. So walk in the light. 1 John 1, 5 says, this is the message which you heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. Don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and the truth is not in us. So walk in the light. Walk in the shadow of Christ and the light of the gospel and bear his armor because this way leads to death. Joshua said it perfectly when he says, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that as we <clears throat> are the armor bearers, putting on the whole armor of God, that we would follow the light, follow the truth, follow the word, follow Christ. Lord, uh, make your word a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And pray, Lord, that we are not uh, bamboozled and tricked into following a false teaching, a false gospel, a false truth, because it ends in death. We thank you, Father, for your teaching today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We are live at 7 Wednesday nights and 10 o'clock Sundays on a sunrise service, April 4th at 6 a.m. God bless you.